I was at home and and all of a sudden I had a visitation of God mm. and uh, something happened now I can't really explain it all to you but in the course this morning I'll share some of it with you because <clears throat> we're living so close to the end of time we've got to change the way we think amen and we can't always think that there will be a tomorrow because there may not be a tomorrow on earth yes there may be a trumpet sound one that you can't hear but all of a sudden the dead in Christ will rise and then the body of Christ will be taken up to meet them. But as I was in, in my in our room on Wednesday night, I was just reading and meditating and talking to the Lord about things. <coughs> and he, he began to share some things with me that I want to share with you because it's so empowering. And you know what? Uh, do Roy, if, if Adonis and, and Cheryl and so on are taking care of the children, would you ask them to bring the children in and be here? Thank you. There's a Bible in front of you on the, that chair if you don't have one. I'd like for you to take it and turn to the Revelation chapter three. Revelation chapter 3, and I want you to skip down to 14, the church of Laodicea. To the angel of the church of Laodicea, I want you to write. These are the words of the Amen. I love that. What that means is, in the Hebrew, that word Amen means surely or truly. And as you follow it through the Bible, it really draws attention to God's authority. And so when you read the word amen here, you are reading about the authority of God. It's not just a climax to a prayer or something of that nature. You are addressing something far greater than that. And, and, and that's God's authority. Okay? The faith to the let's start it. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. <clears throat> so because you are lukewarm, <clears throat> neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Yes, indeed. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Now, none of us want to accept that verse. Amen. All right? Mm. But this is God looking at us. Okay? It is not you looking in the mirror. It's God looking at us, and this is God's appraisal of the church, all right? <clears throat> I counsel you to buy from me gold, gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Now, Father, I ask you, your presence is so real, and there's such an anointing in this place, and I'm so aware of that anointing. And I ask you now, Lord, 
let me be just an oracle through whom you will speak. And I thank you for it, Father. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Now, in these seven churches, though there are seven sites in Turkey, and and if you want, take I've got a book, couple of books in my office because Esther and I have made that trip more than once. And if you want sites of the seven churches, they're there. But that's not really what he's talking about. This is more than just the church that once was built in Laodicea. If it were just something exclusively for those churches, they would not be included in the Bible. And that's why we have something more to be said here than just what God was saying to that people of Laodicea. Because actually, the Laodicean problem is a problem that the churches in America, and I don't know about the rest of the world really, but the churches in America, and in a lot of other countries that once declared themselves Christian, hmm. much of Europe and so on, who once declared themselves Christian, and all of a sudden, what we're seeing and what we're hearing coming out of those places is this lukewarm, this nauseousness that Jesus wants to spit out of his mouth. Now, By Jesus sticking the word amen in here, he is, he's guaranteeing the truth of God's promises that are still available to us today, all right? God speaks promises throughout this book, and they're all available to us. They weren't just available to the New Testament church or to the nation of Israel. These are promises that are yea and amen today. They're available to us. And, and, and I want you to get that into your, your heart, into your mind. I want you to get a hold of the fact that every promise in this book is available to us. Because he's the amen. Hallelujah. All right? And it's there, and it's there for us. Sure. Now... When he speaks of the, the church of Laodicea and he calls them lukewarm, what he's saying is you're a church that's apathetic. You're not showing any feeling. Hmm. Now, some of you can't go as far back in Pentecost as, as a few of us can. Hmm. <clears throat> Kevin, his mother, and I were classmates. We've been in this thing a long time. My brother Al, my wife Esther, we've been in Pentecost for forever. From the time Esther was old enough to be carried to church, that's where she grew up. But I want you to understand what he's saying here is, what's going on in the church is that you're just blah. Hmm. You're plain vanilla. There, there's, there's nothing going on in your life that is exciting as far as God is concerned. Yes. We get too busy in the cares of life and the things that are going on around us that we've lost that touch with God where God wants to speak to us, where we get past this thing of just, ah, uh, hmm. that's not what he wants. He wants a church that's on fire. Hallelujah. He wants a church that's full of life. He wants a church that's expecting things, anticipating things, that are holding God to his promises and saying, God, you said, you promised me that you would be my healer, yes, that you would yes. be my supplier, that yes. you would be everything I need. God, yes. you promised me. Yes. And we have that authority and that right because that's what God is wanting. What, he's, what Jesus is talking about here is the fact that you're nothing. Now, okay. I, some of you may like plain vanilla. I like it with chocolate chips or something. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> or, or even cherry whipped through or something. But what, I'm, what God is talking about here is it's time for the church to wake up. Now, as far as I'm concerned, the average church in America is asleep. 
They yes. come to church. They may have big crowds. But as far as something spiritual, as far as them wanting God to be there to meet them, they're, they're, they're really not there. And that's what Jesus is talking about. Jesus, I believe, and you know, this is the way I said, he's standing at the door and knocking, and he's saying, all right, why are you going to open the door and let me in? Yes. This is supposed to be my house, the house of God. Well, then open the door and let me in. Hallelujah. And but he's, let me go a little farther than that. It's not just church. He's talking about your house. Yes. He's talking about where you live. Yes. He's knocking on that door just as well as amen, he is on the amen. door of the church. And he's saying, you who let me in. And we keep him standing outside knocking on the door because we really aren't all that anxious about having him come in because he's liable to convict us of, <laughs> of our lifestyle or something else that's going on. And, 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 and we, we really don't want that. But you better wake up because these are the end days. Hallelujah. There, there's no... Don't, don't count on a future because there's really not a future to count on. And, and the more you turn on your television and the more you watch what's going on in the world, the more you realize that, hey, uh, it's getting awfully close to the coming of our Lord. Hmm. Amen. And, 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 you know, and what I'm talking about is not just the negative parts of things that's going on in our world, but the exciting part of the fact that God is pouring out his spirit in all kinds of places. <coughs> and... and <clears throat> Pardon me, and, and, and Kevin and I have been watching some videos, and, and, and we're watching God moving in Pakistan, and we're watching God moving in Africa, and in Southern Asia, and, and places where a couple of young men are, are out there preaching the gospel, and, and the crowds that are coming, I mean, huge crowds, Hallelujah! and they're coming, and they're being healed, and they're being delivered, and they're being set free, and, and this gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached into all the world for a witness, Hallelujah. because he said so, yes, yes, he said so, and we're seeing it, even in West Virginia, Hallelujah. all right? If you haven't paid any attention to it, you're missing out on one of the greatest things God's doing in America right now. And that's right down here, in, right up here in West Virginia, where God is moving by his spirit. And it's, it's not only in West Virginia, but it's eastern Kentucky, isn't it? Yes. And we're, we're discovering what God is doing in some of these remote places in America, all right, where people are willing to open the door. Hallelujah. All right? If you don't open the door, he's not going to come in. Hallelujah. And it's one thing to just read about it. It's another thing to realize you have to open the door. Yes. Some of you are looking at me like, huh? It's not enough to say yes in church. It's been, you have to say yes at home. Yes. You have to say yes in your business. You have yes. to say Yes, all through the day, because he's wanting in. He's not just wanting in your house. He wants in your life. He wants to come upon you where you're conscious of his anointing on your life all the time. You turn around and you're there. You feel that excitement, that surge of the Holy Spirit upon you. And you know it's God. Hallelujah. That's what he's saying. I want to do. I want I want to open I want you to open up your door to allow me to come in. Now, now, Jesus promises here that those who are going to stay devoted and true and faithful, um, they'll share in his authority. Yes. Now, I want you to get something. They will share in his authority. Hallelujah. Guess what that means? That means you can tell the devil where to go. Amen. That means you can tell him to take his hands off of your family members, sickness, diseases, Hallelujah. whatever is going on. And that's all, all that's, that's the devil trying to invade your life. And Jesus is saying, I'm giving you my authority. All right. I'm giving you my authority. Well, if we have his authority, then we can tell the devil where to go. And we can tell them to get out of our lives, get out of our finances, quit robbing our, our yes. money, quit robbing us of our health. It's waking up to the understanding that we have the authority. 
Amen. Not him. Amen. Yes. And you don't need to go to somebody and wait for somebody. You know, some people go places wanting a word. Forget that. That's like going to a, a witch and asking her for a word. I mean, it, it's time to wake up and realize that God wants to talk to you. Hallelujah. You don't need to go hunt a prophet. Yes. God That's wants it. To talk right to there. You. He wants In you your to home. Up your heart and your mind. Right where you and are. Allow him. Hallelujah. Allow him to come into your life and talk into your life. Hallelujah. And that's what happened to me Wednesday night. I was reading a biography of Catherine Coleman. Now, it was my privilege to attend a couple of her meetings in Pittsburgh, but I really didn't know much about the lady. Now, I didn't know that she had been married. I didn't know that she and her pa husband had pastored a church. And under their anointing, that church grew and grew and grew. It was packing out the walls. <clears throat> now, I don't know if you know who that Catherine Coleman is. But if you don't, she was a lady an evangelist that God used, oh, in the 50s, the, the 50s primarily and into the 60s some. Um, and, and God used her in such a supernatural way that when I said I went to a couple of rallies in Pittsburgh, the building didn't open, the service didn't start till two o'clock, but if you weren't there at 12 noon, you couldn't get in the building afterwards. Wow. Because all the seats are occupied. Mm. Buses of people would drive up from the Virginias and from the Ohio and so on and drive to that meeting. I was amazed at the number of the people who were Roman Catholics who came to that meeting because they were hungry for God. Hallelujah. Right? And, and, and a friend of mine happened to be on her board, so he got the privilege for me to sit on the platform. And that's an, that's an awesome place to sit because she's, you know, she's sitting, standing there and, and ministering, and all of a sudden she stops and says, there's a lady in a green dress on the third, in the third pew uh, or the third level of seats up there on the end seat, and, and, and this is your problem. And if you'll stand up right now, you'll be healed. Man, she stood up and she was healed. They walked out of there. It was, it was so dynamic. I mean, her life was so dynamic. That was all I knew about it, okay, was that, that, that part of great evangelism. I had no idea that she had been married. Now, she and her husband never divorced. He just took off and left. This all happened because they were pastoring this church and God was pouring out his spirit there and people were coming. And then all of a sudden, bam, something happened and everybody left. And nobody would come to the meetings. And so her poor husband got so distraught that he just drifted off. He, he couldn't cope with it. And, and Catherine, she made a choice. Now, either I can quit, or I can find out what's going on and move with God. Hallelujah. Now, she made the choice of finding out what was going on, and then, you know what she said? And this hit me like a, wow. I mean, it was like the Holy Spirit just went wham across my face to get my attention. She said that God showed her that they were doing miracles in that building. They were casting out spirits and bringing deliverance to people and setting them free. But they didn't clean the building. Mm. And those demons that were delivered there began to drive the people out of there. Mm. All right? And within a few months, there was no more church. And her husband, who couldn't cope with this, because he couldn't understand what was going on. All right? And then I'll tell you what, there are a couple of great biographies of this lady. And, 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 and really, if you want to uh, talk to me later, but, but the, uh, what God was showing me, because I was going through the same problem. Now, some of you were a part of Lighthouse years ago. But some of you don't know anything about our pre-existence. <laughs> but God was pouring out his presence at 854 Coniston Road. And we were watching God do all kinds of miracles. 
it was not unusual. We had a, a, a young evangelist in one week, one day, one night. And um, our auditorium seated a little over 200 people. We had to open up the doors to the foyers and allow seats out there so people could be there. It was not unusual to see the place so packed out. There just wasn't room. On Wednesdays, Esther would, she had a meeting, a prayer meeting for ladies, and, and that was a joke. It wasn't just a prayer meeting. It was a time for people to come and be healed and people to come and be delivered. And Esther would call me in. She, we had sort of had a rule. If it's a, 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 a simple case, she'd take care of it. But if it was anything more than that, it was my responsibility. And I had to go in. After all, I was the pastor. <laughs> and, and, and I'm not joking now, all right? When the Spirit of God began to move on these ladies, one day I walked in there and there's this lady lying on the front pew and out of her mouth was coming the most foul language I've ever heard in my life. But God so thoroughly cleansed her and delivered her that from that time on she was a different person. Amen. Hallelujah. Another time Esther called me, this lady was lying on the floor and she was really demonically controlled. And Esther called me there, and so I went down there, and I knelt next to her, and she put her hand under my stomach and lifted me off the ground. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to have every experience? <laughs> I cried out for Jesus. <laughs> I didn't want any little, little woman like that. And when I say little, I mean little. She was not much bigger than my wife. If she was any bigger than my wife, and yet with one hand she lifts me off the floor. And she had all these different voices. Oh yeah, yeah. She she went everything from a, a little child's voice to a big man's voice, and everything in between that was coming out of her mouth. But people walked out of there different. It, it, it wasn't no matter how they came in and how they behaved there. The fact was when they left, they were different. Hallelujah. And all of a sudden, we went from a church that was flying high. And I mean that seriously. Because even with, I mean, we were one of the top givers in missions in, in our district here. Uh, the, the, the money was just coming in. It was there. It was never a problem. At, at, at one time, we had a children's pastor, a young people's pastor, a senior's pastor, and myself, and then someone who took care of worship in addition to five staff members in the office. I mean, that's how the church was going. And then all of a sudden, it went boom. And I kept saying, God, what in the world's going on? God, what happened? Even the building was almost destroyed. We got hit by, in two years in a row by, by hurricanes that came through. The last one said... They, they estimated that it would cost us over a million dollars to repair the building. Yeah. Now, the building was built in 1950, and I'm talking now about 2005, and I felt like the building wasn't worth a million dollars to repair it. And besides that, we only had parking for 20 cars. And, and that was always a problem because We'd park on the streets, and one day we went out there after church, and some cop had gone by and put tickets on every car's window. Mm. And I collected them all, and I went to the chief on the next on Monday, and I gave them to him. And he made sure that nobody ticketed a car that was parked on those streets anymore. Amen. But what I want you to understand is, there's a reason why things stop. All right. And it isn't because you've sinned. Catherine did not sin. Her husband did not sin. All right? But all, later, God began to show Catherine what had happened. And that was when God began to speak to me Wednesday evening. And he said, you've been asking what happened because I was taking the blame for it. And I was telling God, "There's I screwed up somewhere. Maybe I got too involved in my African work and... And, and, and in the work that we were doing in, in Zambia, where for 10 years we spent uh, a lot of time in there and whatever. And I was saying, okay, God, uh, God I'm sorry if I did that and I wasn't your will, uh, I'm sorry. But then it wasn't really true because during that time, God opened up doors and, and some of you know, but 
we watched God move mountains. You talk about moving mountains. I mean, it was absolutely miraculous. God said to me, you're not going to raise any money in church. I don't want you to go out and raise money. I'm going to supply the money. Now, I had never done that before. I had always raised the money. Okay? But when God says, that's not how you're going to do it anymore, that's what he means. He says, now I'm going to do it. And I want you to understand something. It was absolutely miraculous. I never saw anything like it. In 2000, when he said to start this, all of a sudden money started coming. From people I never heard of. Some of it because Charisma Magazine carried us, and some of it locally because a local television station and newspaper covered it. But all of a sudden, money began to pour in. I'm not talking little money. One month, God said, I'm going to give you $100,000 this month. And on the last day of the month, I'm saying to him, God, I don't have $100,000. I've got $38,000. I need a few bucks. He said, go to the post office. I said, I'd already been there. He said, go to the post office. I, I, I went to the post office. There was an envelope in my, our box. I took it out. I opened it up. I had to run out of the building because I didn't want them hearing me scream. <laughs> because in that envelope was a check for over $60,000. So I'm talking about. Now, what I'm getting at is, when God says to do something, do God's it. going to supply. But at the same time, I'm watching Lighthouse go down the tubes. Yeah. And I'm saying, God, what's going on? What are we doing wrong? What are we missing? Well, the other night, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you forgot something. You taught people how to cast out the devils. You told them how to clean their house. You told them all about what they need to do. But he said, you know what? The same thing that Catherine and her husband didn't do, you didn't do. And that was clean house from all the demons that you cast out. They found a habitation. And even though you can't see them and you can't feel them, you can't breathe them, they're there. And all of a sudden, we watched everything go crumbling down. And after that hurricane of 05 that hit there and tore up the building, we sold the building. We started holding Sunday morning services over here at the, what is now the Embassy Suites Hotel. And every Sunday morning we'd bring in our equipment and set it up and have a service there and, and so on. But something was missing. Something was missing. And since we've been here, and I'll, I'll never forget the first time Esther and I came here. Some of you remember Brother Tony, who's gone to be with Jesus. Brother Tony was here. Juan and Francesca were here with us. And we were standing over here in the middle of the floor. And over there, there was no wall there. There was a little farther back. Was the, re the guy that was re trying to rent this place and the guy that brought us here. They were standing over there, and we were standing here, and we started speaking in tongues and praying. And, and it was hilarious, because if you looked at their eyes, their eyes got big, like, what are these people doing? <laughs> <laughs> and God was so clear that he said, this is where I want you to be. Well, I have struggled with that. You know, I look around you. We've got more empty seats than we have people here. In addition to that, we've got more empty seats and storage that belong to the same set. And I've been talking to God about it. Now, I don't know if you do things like that, but yes. after I sat there on Wednesday and read this biography of Catherine, I said, God, and, I'll, and just that quickly, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, that was your problem. You cast out the demons out of them. You told them how to go home and do spiritual warfare. You told them how to clean out their houses and protect their house, but you didn't protect yours. Mm -hmm. And I said, all right, God, what about now? 
that was then, this is now. Because now we've sort of developed a different attitude about things here. Even if I have workmen come in, and I don't care whether they're Comcast or whoever, when they leave, I treat them like they all came in demon-possessed. Amen. And don't, don't misinterpret what I'm saying. But I don't know what people are coming in with. Amen. Even when they come to my house, to work in our house, a, a, a serviceman of some kind or whatever, I don't know what they're bringing with them. But when they leave, Esther and I clean house. God, I don't know what they brought in, but God, in Jesus' name, we ask you to remove it. Yes. Whatever demons came, whatever yes. happened, clean the house. Yes, Lord Jesus. And I'll tell you what God is saying to me. God is saying to me, I want you to get back to what you used to expect every time you came to church. But I want you to excite the people here, you, because I'm asking God for his anointing to flow upon your lives. It, 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 not just one or two oh, yeah. people. I'm not, not, I don't mean that. And, and it isn't just the visitors coming by because we've got so many words from people that have come by here and been with us. And that's not what I'm wanting. That's what God's doing that to encourage us and to wake us up to reality because God is saying, I'm an incredible God. Hallelujah. Yes. And if you read, follow my devotions at all, you know that I was in there this past week and dealt with a couple of words that, that <clears throat> pardon me, came up in Job to describe God. And I took time to elaborate upon the words because I wanted you to understand how big God is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's nothing that goes on this earth, nothing that goes on here, that God is not bigger than. Yes. Some of you don't think so. Hallelujah. Well, I've got news for you. I don't care what you think. That's right. <laughs> He's bigger than that. Hallelujah. That's why he can say, I'm the amen. Amen. I'm the one that's going to make it work. Hallelujah. I'm the one that's so much bigger than you. But you've got to get that into your heads. You've got to get it into the, the way you think, whether it's about your home, whether it's about your business, whether it's about your finances, whatever it's about. I don't care what it's about, but you've got to get the understanding in your head that my God is bigger than. And when he uses words like this, he's telling us to expect things. I'm looking back at a prophetic word that was spoken last July by a young man he came up to me. He, I was sitting here. It was at the Esther Network Day of Prayer, and and we'd been having a day of prayer here in the in, in <clears throat> pardon me. And this young man came up to me, and he he spoke two words to me that I I have written down. I keep them in my office because I keep reminding God. All right. He said, first of all, people from the neighborhood are going to start coming here. Well, we when 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 Jerry was here. We went through all that neighborhood over there and over there. Nobody showed up. All right. But God said, I'm, you're going to affect the neighborhood. Secondly, he said, I'm going to bring the finances in. And so I remind him every month, it's time for rent. God... 